Welcome to In Conversation. Terry Gilliam, the maverick director of Time Bandits, Brazil, The Fisher King, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and most recently, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, came to fame for his work with Monty Python. But he always wanted to direct. Brazil was critically acclaimed, but a difficult sell. The adventures of Baron Munchausen gave him the reputation of going over budget, although it was the one and only time. Various forces, both natural and financial, came bearing down on his epic project, Man of La Mancha, causing the shoot to collapse. He maintains Hollywood still doesn't like him, but many critics regard him as one of the world's most imaginative and original directors. It isn't very long, Terry, mm. since I saw Lost in La Mancha, a marvellous film about the failure to make a film. Mm. Don Quixote, that was. It must have been hell for you. And now you're going to try again. Is it going to be a similar kind of thing, or are you changing it a little bit? Well, basically what happened after uh, finally getting the script back, after seven years and not reading it during that mm. time, uh, I opened it up and thought, this doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> and... Uh, so I've actually rethought a lot of it. There's, yeah. I'd say two-thirds is the same, but the, there's a kind of premise that changes everything, and it's a far yeah. better film. So in some ways, the fact that it failed when it did might have been a blessing. Yeah. This will actually be the fifth incarnation in this movie, the fifth oh, attempt gosh. to do it, and each time it gets cheaper. I mean, so nothing you saw in the documentary is going to be in the film. None of those scenes, I cut them all out. They're all gone. gone. They're all, all gone. gone. Oh, dear. So, I know, so it's, that's why in my own mind I can think about it as a, uh, as a new project. Did it take you uh, a lot to get out from under the shadow of Monty Python? I think Brazil did that. Was the one well, I mean? Yes, like, I'm sure. Yeah, because they made that, Jabberwocky, went... which was you know Mike Palin was starring in it, yeah. Terry Jones is in it, and it was very Pythonic on many levels. Mm. And I was judged on Pythonic uh, criteria, and it wasn't supposed to be a Python film. It was no. trying to be something else. It was very interesting in, in countries that didn't know Python. It was received very well in countries yeah. that liked Python, it was sort of torn apart. Mm. Uh, Time Bandits was an important one, because even though it was, again, yes. in some ways you could say a series of sketches, it ended up being a huge success. It made uh, almost $50 million then. That's, you know, that's probably around $200 million now. So mm. it is the most succe uh, successful thing I've done there, which opened up the doors for me yes. in, in Hollywood and, and actually led to the making of Brazil, which then closed the doors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know what I want. You won't believe this. Um, I know it's going to sound incredible, but, um, but I've been dreaming about you. I mean, I love you. In my dreams, I love you. What did they not like about Brazil? Was it just you? No, because they didn't the know. No, I, was, I wasn't actually any trouble because they didn't know me at that time. Yeah. I mean, we made the film completely outside of that. And the only first time that anyone in Hollywood saw the movie was when we showed it uh, to the, the studio heads. And I remember uh, as the screening was ending, I, I snuck up into the projection booth to see what the backs of their necks were like. Mm. And as the lights came up, you could see these knotted backs of necks, red with anger. And they walked out. They hated the film. It was and it was political, and uh, and it had an unhappy ending mm. uh, where our hero goes mad. It you know. But on the other hand, what was interesting, which made it more complicated, was Sid Sheinberg, who was running the studio. 
He was intrigued by the film. He was really intrigued. His wife, who was the, you know, you know, Lorraine, what was her last name? She was the wife of uh, Roy Scheider in Jaws. Yeah, yeah. Liked the film enormously. So he was a man conflicted and, and, yeah. and torn. And I, and me, that evening, showed it to Steven Spielberg, who was, you know, working at Universal, and, and Sid Sheinberg always felt Steven was his protege. Uh, Stephen was more than that, but and I showed it to Stephen, who just was blown away by the movie, mm. and I was hoping he was going to put a good word in, but it didn't quite work that way. And so when I was put in a position where, you know, trim the film, change the story, compromise the thing, mm. I said no, uh, and I just was not willing to do it. So that created a certain uh, uh, mm. frisson in the yeah. air. But it, it's and that also is probably one of the things that has has followed me where Hollywood thinks I'm trouble because I you know publicly took on the studio yes. and embarrassed the studios mm. publicly, which mm. is probably a bad thing to do politically. Yeah. We've always been close, haven't we? Yes, Jack. But until this all blows over, just stay away from me. We started this, these clandestine screenings for the L.A. critics yeah. and on the night that Out of Africa opened in New York with everybody, the big film of the year for Universal, mm -hmm. suddenly the L.A. critics said, best picture Brazil, best screenplay Brazil, best direction Brazil. And, yeah. and they, they'd never been caught in such an embarrassing situation. They had to release the film. Mm. <laughs> I suppose Munchausen was, uh, was the film which that didn't make very much money, unfortunately. It was a lovely yeah. film. I liked the film yeah, very I know. much. I remember your review. Uh, it's on the poster. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of people didn't, of course. Of course. Uh, well, that was my, you know, that was my comeuppance moment. Oh, it was, it was the perfect Wellsian, uh, mm. uh, magnificent Ambersons moment. Uh, and I got my comeuppance because the film went way over budget. It went out of control. Mm. Uh, was that your fault? No, I actually can honestly <laughs> say that it wasn't no because it, because I had storyboarded the whole movie. Yeah. It had been budgeted. Everything I had an uh, uh, extraordinary producer who, uh, like Munchausen, was the greatest liar on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a lot of there were a lot of strange things going on. I mean, for a film that was supposed to be a twenty-one week shoot, in the sixth week all the money was gone. <laughs> It's agreed. Friday the 28th, you surrender. That's uh, no. three weeks from tomorrow. We can fix the details later. No, 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 no. You surrender. With respect, Sultan, we've been through all this. You surrender. But we're winning. The thing went completely out of control, but it was perfect because, you know, after what happened with Brazil, it was the great story. So now you can see the man is a monster, he's out of control, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Hollywood loved it. So that put me in, in the black books for quite a while. Well, that was a black mark. And then oh, yeah, after that, did you well, have any projects you really wanted to do and couldn't? Oh, I'm, I, I always have things, and I, I kind of I, I, I put them out of mind now more than not. Put them not. out of mind, yeah. Because mind just, you, yeah. you could have done Braveheart. Imagine This that. is true. You I could, could have, have done the first Harry Potter film. I, I wish you had. I know. But I wish you had. I, you could have done Forrest Gump. Go blame What a fool I've been, <laughs> Derek. Oh, no. I could have had a career. I could have been you a contender. Could have been a career. <laughs> I could have been a contender. <laughs> oh, I wonder what you'd have made of Forrest Gump. That would have been interesting. Oh, I just, I knew that period too well. I didn't like what, <laughs> yeah. I didn't like the script. Harry Potter, I knew, despite the fact they flew me out, I knew they were not, were not going to hire no, me. No, they probably were. Well, no, they were doing it, no, they, no, they were doing it for one reason, to show on J.K. Rowling that, uh, because she wanted me to direct it, but and it was. She, yes. Oh yeah, no, that was David Heyman, the producer, and J.K. Rowling wanted me, and I and I agree with him. I was the right guy because I know that material. I know how to do that stuff. Mm. Uh, and with the studio, they wanted a safe pair of hands, and they got yes, a safe pair of hands. Yes, certainly got one, dear, oh dear. But you've always had some sort of trouble mm. with the, with Hollywood in yeah. particular. The funny thing is that the films I made in Hollywood, the three films. Uh, Fisher King, uh, Twelve Monkeys, and uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas were the easiest films I've made. That's what's really intriguing about it. And they're also the most ex uh, successful, most probably, successful. financially. So that's been kind of interesting. I, 
But in all those cases, they were projects that would not normally get through the system, but for a variety of yeah. circumstances, they got green lit. And in, in, in most of those cases, it was about the fact I could lure major stars on board. And once you've got them on board, hmm. the studios, you know, their hands stay off you a bit. You're protected yeah. by the star power. You had no trouble with stars in Fisher King, I mm. understand, don't think, did you? No, I think, I think my job was actually to lure uh, Robin Williams on board. That's what it was. Well, you know, he can be trouble, but I don't think he was for no. you, was he? No, I love Robin. I, think he's, he's, I, I don't think Robin is ever trouble. It's just that trying to find the right uh, part for Robin, where it uses his abilities without letting him just go mm. all over the place. I can't get it. Because... He's out there. He's always out there. That's why you can get it. That's why you're the one. I'm not the one. I'm not anyone. Forget about the about the shoes. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a cab. Uh, Perry. Perry. I'm Jack. I know. Fisher King was the first film I made in Hollywood. Yes. That was like, it was, I'd, I'd, I'd become that depressed that I finally yeah. went to Hollywood yeah. after Munchausen. And, and I, yeah. I just, I thought, I, I, the script came, and what was interesting about the script, Richard Legravenes wrote, wrote it, and it was the first script he'd ever written. And now he's one of the top writers in Hollywood. And, and that was, that was that's what I think was wonderful about it, because it had that freshness that somebody mm. who wrote on spec, he wrote it for himself. And the characters, I just loved them all. And I thought, this is going to be easy. There's no special effects in it. There's no, it's just four people. It's a four-hander. Mm. It, was, it was a joy. It was also the first time that I really, I didn't storyboard. I didn't do any of that. The actors dictated things. And that was, for me, a nice change uh, where I didn't have to worry about this light or the blue screen or any of that, this weird stuff. I also discovered at that point that the way it works is to make sure that you, who is in the foxhole with you for the final battle. Mm. And as long as, like, Robin and Jeff and the girls are happy, we're all comfortable with what we've done, yeah. they can't touch us. Mm. <laughs> and, and, then, and then it was a big success, and, it was, and then along came on 12 Monkeys. I, I guess they give you some chemical restraints, huh? Drugs! What did they give you? Thorazine? Haldol? How much? How much? Learn your drugs. Know your doses. It's elementary. I need to make a telephone call. Telephone call, a telephone call. That's communication with the outside world, doctors. Discretion. Ah, uh, nah. Uh, hey, if all of these nuts could just make phone calls, they could spread insanity oozing through telephone cables, oozing to the ears of all these poor, sane people, infecting them. Wackos everywhere, plague of madness. Come on, let's go. In fact, very few, Jim. Jim. Very few of us here are actually mentally ill. I'm not saying you're not mentally ill. For all I know, you're <coughs> crazy as a loon. But that's not why you're here. That's not why you're here. It's not why you're here. You're here because of the system. There's the television. It's all right there. All right there. Look, listen, Neil, pray. Commercials. We're not productive anymore. At least to make things anymore. It's all automated. What are we for then? We're consumers, Jim. I remember after the film came out, and I was at Warner Brothers, and uh, the production guys saying, oh, wonderful film, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, that was really amazing. We cast everybody against type. We, it was a really intelligent script, complicated. Uh, you know, it was uh, uh, strange ideas in it. And I thought that was amazing that it was a big success. And they said, what are you talking about? It's very simple, two words why it was successful. It wasn't Bruce Willis, it was Brad Pitt. What about fear and loathing? Because some people thought you'd got the wrong actor for that. No, Fear and Loathing was an interesting one because they'd, people had been chasing me for about 10 years with various scripts to do, and I always said no because I was a bit frightened of doing it. I mean, it's one of my favorite books. It's a very important book in my life anyway because mm -hmm. I'm that generation. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened was that Alex Cox was doing it and he had cast Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro, and unfortunately Alex got the ax. And they were looking for somebody, and it came to me. And I'd wanted to work with Johnny for a long time. Uh, I thought he was f phenomenal. And so I said yes, and we rewrote the script, Tony Cruzani and I. And off we went. And it was, it, that was a joy, because 
The thing about Johnny is he always wanted to be a python. Mm. And, and oh, really? He, oh, yeah. No, yeah. He, he, his comic sense is brilliant. And we just had a ball. I mean, I said, we're sharks. We're desert sharks. We only move forward. We can never look back. We have to keep moving. And that's the way we shot it. We worked fast and, and constantly inventing things. And Johnny would, you know, I'd come in the morning. I've got an idea. He says, wait, I've been thinking. I've got a better idea. And, would, mm -hmm. and things would just happen. And it was... It was a joy. And then when it came to releasing it, the studio just didn't know what to do. And once again, mm. it didn't fit. It doesn't fit in things. And they basically sold it as a uh, two wild guys on a weird and wonderful weekend in Vegas. I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the things worth doing, worth doing right. Oops. This is the American dream in action. Shouldn't we be fools not to ride this strange torpedo all the way out to the end? Indeed. We must do it. What kind of story is this? It's the Min 400. It's the richest off-road race for motorcycles and dune buggies in the history of organized sport. It's a fantastic spectacle in honor of some fat back row zero who owns the luxurious Min Hotel in downtown Las Vegas. At least that's what the press release says, anyway. Well, as your attorney, I advise you to buy a motorcycle. How else can you cover a thing like this, righteous? Well, we're gonna have to... Draw it up on our own. Pure gonzo journalist. There are lots of filmmakers like you who want to make the audience think, and they generally make art movies. I know. Well, I'm caught in this thing, and I've just recently I've been dealing with the, the fact that my movies are somewhere between. They're not really art house movies, so, yeah. you know, the, the Hanukkah crowd, the, uh, the Almodovar crowd, that's a certain crowd. And then there's, you know, Tim Burton, Michael Bay, uh, you know, um, mm. um, that, that Hollywood thing. I'm stuck in the middle, uh, mm. which is a weird thing. I like it because it's... On one hand, it's, it gives me a kind of freedom. On the other hand, I'm not sure either critics or audiences know how to deal with what I do sometimes. I mean, uh, because, you know, they're comic, they're silly sometimes, they're sort of visually extravagant, and yet the ideas, are, I think, are quite serious that I'm dealing mm. with. But I've always been... You know, Mary Poppins has always been my guide through uh, <laughs> cinema, you know, and I try to, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the sugar that helps the medicine go down, so yeah. I put a lot of sugar on my right. things. Yeah. <laughs> but what sort of films do you like yourself? What have influenced you? See, I think it comes through periods in your life. And, and uh, you know, as a kid, it was Walt Disney uh, animated yeah. films. I mean, I... Pinocchio is always on my top ten list of films. Oh, right? Dumbo is mine. Is it? <laughs> I mean, these were extraordinarily beautiful, wonderful films. Yes, and and they I was were. as a child, that and I also um, Michael Powell Corda's uh, Thief of Baghdad. These are the things yes. I remember as as a child. Mm. And then I remember moving as I got older. I moved into Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. It was comedies. And then I woke up one day and I saw Paths of Glory at a children's matinee in the mm. San Fernando Valley. I said. Films can be about something. They can yeah. really be about injustice. They can be about ideas. And then, then I started discovering European films. So then suddenly so it was Chris Buñuel, Bergman. I mean, these were gods to me. And yes. Fellini, I, I just, I didn't want to watch American films. And mm. I'm, I'm very bad the way I watch things. There's no consistency in the way oh, I watch. Well. And they come and they go. So I've mm. had huge gaps in my film knowledge. I mean, when I bump into somebody like Quentin Tarantino or Marty Scorsese, it's embarrassing because they're referencing this, that, and the other thing. I know. They I, are, don't know what yes, yeah, well, I don't know what they're talking about. You didn't yeah. train in any way, did you, really? Well, well, I did. I remember the first... I had a job. I was editing a, a um, um, humor magazine in New York with Harvey Kurtzman, who created Mad Comics. And... I mean, it was it was a part-time job, and and I remember getting a job in a studio that did stop motion work. Uh, it, did, it wasn't yeah. a job; they had no money, so I was working for free. But I just wanted to be around yeah. the gear. I wanted to see what it was like, and and that's that was kind of it. And then I used to I remember I used to uh, go around post-production houses and and get reels of their 35 millimeter film that was usually clear on uh, leaders mm. and things, and we used to animate on that things like that. So it was all self-taught and. And and it was when we did uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail was really the first film mm. we made. We learned on the job. I had I had bought myself a little Bolex 16 mil camera and I used to go out and make little movies. Mm. But it was self-taught. How do you think animation is going now? Because there's more and more animated films coming out. Do you approve of this or do you yeah. think? 
No, I think it's, I'm glad that animation is up and running again. I think Pixar are wonderful, I think. I'm actually a huge fan of Pixar. I, I put Toy Story 1 and 2 very high on my list mm. of films. I think they're beautiful work. Uh, and I think what's interesting about Pixar that I like is the way they work. It isn't a, 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 mm. a, an executive down thing. It's the creative people are the executives. Yes. It's, and that's... That that, remi- that feels to me like what Python was. We were doing everything. We were in charge, and I think mm. that's wonderful. And the results, as we can see, are, are hugely mm. successful and wonderful films. And well, the then why don't you do an animated feature? Because Pixar haven't hired me yet. I keep, <laughs> I keep every time I go you. to a Pixar movie, I say, no. boy, I'd love to work at Pixar. I do this on... on but you on, would like to do one, I imagine you would. I mean, I, looking at your early career, you'd yeah. think, well, he's going to make one. I know. Some I, point. I, I don't know. I, what I really love is working with actors. In animation, you've got, in a sense, you've got total control. And I like the fact that I don't have total control. I like the surprises that come along, the things that happen as a result of the combinations of people or events. Mm. That, and and they, I think some of the uh, solutions to what the problems that arise in those situations are better than my original intentions. Well, I mean... Thinking, sir, that, um, you know, it's quite obvious that people, you know, not many people are attracted to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you know, forgive me, but I, I, I have a couple of solutions to your problems. One, I was thinking of, you know, changing the style of the show. And two, I would um, change the audience, perhaps. Change? Yeah. <laughs> You know, but in, in my opinion, I'd change both. But, you know, that's just me. And I'd... Change a show? Who the friggin' hell do you think you are? Don't be so afraid of change, mate. Parnassus is the perfect situation, uh, the imaginary of Dr. Parnassus, with Heath dying in the middle of the shoot. And the final film is a different film. It's the same film, but it's very different in yes. its, um, its effect, I think. It's probably more magical for a lot of people. It's more surprising than it would have been. It may not be as dramatic as it might have been if Heath had played all the character all the way through. But it was, you know, it was... Very interesting, that experience of trying to solve the problem when your main actor dies. And I thought I'd had a hard time with uh, Munchausen. I thought it was a hard time with, with uh, Quixote. But mm. this was, those were like, sort of like exercise for this mm. one. And yeah. if I hadn't been through, through those experiences, I bet I would have caved in on Parnassus. But I didn't. Would you? Yeah, I think I would have. Because I I, at the time, I didn't know what to do, and I also didn't want to do anything because you just lost a very close friend mm. and who was that kind of vitality and talent and energy, and it's gone, vanished. And, and, and But, you know, I was surrounded by people who had seen Lost in La Mancha who had seen and said, we're not going to let this happen again. Yeah. You know, and they yeah. were the ones that, you know, kept me going until I, my head started yeah. spinning again. Another possibility, come, come, come. You must make a choice. Mm-hmm. Actually, to be quite honest, I would strongly recommend this one. The Contelar. <sighs> Rudolf Valentino. James Dean. Princess Di. All these people. They're all dead. Yes but immortal, nevertheless. They won't get old or fat. They won't get sick or feeble. They are beyond fear because they are forever young. They are gods. And you can join them. Is there a thread through your work? My wife says I keep making the same movie. I just change the costumes. <laughs> well, so it's everybody all, it's, makes the same movie yeah, all the time. It's, Unwell used to say that. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's that borderline between imagination <laughs> and reality, whatever that is. Mm. And reality can be even more bizarre than imagination, and vice versa. Imagination might be incredibly tedious, but it's, I, and I and I just think. I'm just trying to keep that path. And, each, and every film, I suppose, is just another exploration of where that borderline yes. is. But yeah. is it more difficult now to make your kind of film because they don't want to take so many risks? Yeah, I know. What, I mean, right now we seem to be in an age where technology is the most important thing to talk mm. about. 
And then, so Avatar. Okay, now Avatar is a, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary achievement yes. on a technical level. There's no question about that. And all the other levels, we've seen the movie before in one form or another. But, but Hollywood is, it's like if you read now the press or what Hollywood is saying, 3D is here, as if Avatar was, was day one of 3D. Well, forget mm -hmm. about the 50s, but, but in the last several years, there have been many 3D movies. Yes. But, and, and it's like, but now, forget about those, Avatar. And then and, and when you read the press, and Alice in Wonderland is successful because it's the next movie to come along after Avatar that's in 3D. So everything is about 3D. Now, the, the studios love this because they can control technology. Yes, they that's can't right. control creativity. Mm -hmm. And so they think this is the answer, 3D, 3D, 3D. And, and I think if they approach it that way, it'll probably end up like 3D in the 50s because... Technology is not ultimately why we go to the movies. Mm. I mean, now when you see CG, uh, it doesn't have the same effect it did with Jura when we saw Jurassic no, it Park. Doesn't. No. And it I think sub sub it. yeah. some, it's in subconsciously we know, well, that's just CG. We're, it's, we're in the Rococo age of filmmaking where it's filigree and spin the more you can keep things moving and twisting and turning, the happier people are, yeah. and, and you know, and, and it's not. There's very often, very seldom that you actually okay, just stop, let the mm. camera sit there, let the thing develop in its own time, mm. and people are not accustomed to that anymore, mm. which is a pity. And and so I think it's an interesting time to be living in. I don't think it's going to go away. The films, all I do, I do know that my films seem to last. That's what I like about them. Mm.